Now, um, this panel is called Informal Justice by Spanish Corporations. Um, and as the title suggests, and probably for the relief of much of the audience, uh, we're moving a bit away from legal technical issues, um, um, especially the questions of legal liability and litigation, to questions of what you might call social responsibilities of corporations, right? Um, we've just, and in a way it connects very nicely to the, to the, to the end of the last panel where we've heard about problems of legal overregulation, which of course then poses the question, well, how about corporate self-regulation, right? Um, and the question that we heard about sort of certain limitations, sort of European corporations should respect human rights within Europe yet, but then that might be appropriate perhaps for a small and medium-sized enterprise, but what about European corporations indeed that operate globally in third countries? What should their responsibilities be? And what do we, to put it concisely, what do we say as European societies expect of our corporate nationals, as they are often called, when they operate in third countries? What are their social responsibilities, perhaps rather than legal responsibilities? Something that John Ruggi, who designed these UN guiding principles, has called the corporation's social um, responsibility to respect human rights. Now, we'll kick off this panel um, with an intervention by Carlos Cordero. Um, Carlos and myself met in Bangladesh some years back to discuss um, issues relating to decent work and human rights protection there, among other things in the garment factory. So I expect that Carlos will also have a lot to say uh, on one of the cases we want to discuss in the second part of the panel, the Rana Plaza case. Um, Carlos is a founder and managing partner of a Social Innovation Sustentia, an NGO, right? No. No? It's a business. Pardon me? Business. A business. A business with rich experience, anyway, in the areas of business and human rights, um, both in Europe and in Latin America. Um, after Carlos' intervention, we'll have the opportunity, as already indicated, to discuss two cases, the Inditex case and the Rana Plaza case, that illustrate some of the issues at stake in um, sort of um, non-legal approaches to corporate responsibilities. Um, and for the panel discussion, we are joined by um, Alberto Munoz, who's a, and I hope I pronounced your names correctly, um, who's a professor of law at the University of Navarra, and Maria Lopez Aposada, Apo, mm. um, who works with a non profit private company uh, that um, uh, defends the interests of um, disabled persons, as I understand it. Yes. Um, this is the second part, but um, for, for now I'd give the um, floor to Carlos. Um, the title of his presentation is Public Policies, Public Policies and Due Diligence, no, sorry, is it Public Policies? Public Policies and Due Diligence as Key Drivers Towards Effective Remedies. Yeah, more or less, yes. Sorry, <laughs> my own, my own handwriting. Nice. Well, I, 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 to be, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's very interesting to me to share and to learn from all of you and share my thoughts and my experience on, on this field. Uh, I, I, I told you business, but in fact, we are a very, very micro uh, business, uh, specialized in anti-corruption, business and human rights, and transparency and right to access to information, but it's a consultancy and also a professor in university, all the team. But anyway, uh, I'm going to I'm I'm going to try. I, I got a PowerPoint, but any, I'm not going to use that because because I, I'm going to leave to Katerina. Thank you to Governance for for the invitation. And well, from 2004, we started to work on business and human rights uh, at the more or less when the the when the the problem with the the norms in the after the problems with the norms in the United Nations and the and the Kofi Annan uh, give the 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 mandate to 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 the Professor Raggi to to give a solution to the common approach on business and human rights, the issue. 
and we 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 have been working in projects and in missions and researchers in Spain and Europe, Latin America, Asia, and with the different stakeholders, governments, businesses, business associations, trade unions, NGOs. We 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 really have a very close relationship with the ECCJ and with the ICAR. That's a, the big networks on, in NGOs focus on this, and I'm, not, I'm going to try to to share with you uh, um, our concerns and our perspective of the challenges of the of the of the framework and the guiding principles, the real effective implementation in that. Our maybe our. More, most interesting experiences from 2011 to, to, to until, until now. We have been uh, working in Colombia. Colombia, as you as you can imagine, is, is not really easy uh, country to work on on in general on human rights, but especially in business and human rights. And we are starting with a multi-stakeholder approach, focused on capacity building to improve the dialogue between different uh, parties. And, and with a round table with uh, four uh, parties, um, government, uh, human rights defenders and trade un unions, uh, business association and business, and international uh, community, uh, Spanish embassy, um, UK embassy, uh, Netherlands, uh, United Nations programs working on that. And, uh, and uh, the excuse was the guiding principles, the excuse for sitting around the table. And, and the question was, what should be done in Colombia for effective implementing the, the, the recommendation and guiding principles? We started working on that. For surprise to us, it was result and was a really very interesting outcomes, even to two documents that we that are in the, they are in our um, PowerPoint in our sorry web in Spanish. And after that, uh, the Colombian government asked for uh, capacity building to the public sector for 65 public officers in the ministry committee that it has the mandate to develop a, pu a public policy on, on this. And after that, well, regional work, workshop in Cartagena, Cali, Medellin, and, and the last uh, activity was uh, giving capacity building to the Defensoria del Pueblo, that is like uh, human rights institutions that in the case of Colombia also have a, a public defenders to the victims uh, directly. Well, well, the first idea from this experience is uh, the that if we would like to improve the effectiveness in the remedy, we have to work at, at the same time in the different level, but at the same time in the other two pillars. Because it's there, a very, uh, there are very close links between things in, one, in the pillar one, pillar sec second, and pillar third. And it's very difficult to, to make access to remedy if you don't uh, modify or improve the regulation, the capacity building of the, the public officers or on other instruments, or if you don't improve the due diligence of the private sector as well. So the other thing is, the other idea is that when we are talking about access to remedy, uh, some people is thinking in judicial remedy, and some people is, is, is just focused on the operational remedy. But the, the approach of John Raggi and the, the guiding principles is, is, a, is, a, is a unique scheme with different instruments. And the effective uh, is, is very important that because the effective of the, the operational one influence in the, in, the, in the effective of judicial one and, and in the other way exactly the same. Uh, when uh, in some international debates in Geneva, mainly uh, when we discuss about uh, what should be done and why, why doesn't work uh, the, the implementation of guiding principles, uh, there's a, in my opinion, a, a no correct uh, dilemma the, between 
to go to the, to, we have to make the effort on the, on the local approach or in the international approach. I think it is, uh, should be considered that everything is linked. Um, regarding the, sta the state of duty to protect, uh, we found that there is a big gap between the guiding principle proposed and the current situation in the national legislation, public instruments, and public policies, international agreements, capacities to prevent, investigate, punish, and redress human rights violations by businesses. Um, for example, in Colombia, uh, much of the people, they, there's no awareness, no, 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 I'm not talking about skill knowledge, and awareness what exactly is saying the guiding principles. So if you have to in, include criteria in the um, commercial trade uh, in, the, in relation with uh, preventing human rights abuse uh, of the companies that invest in your country is, is very interesting to know a little bit what's expecting from, um, at least from the uh, United Nations. Uh, also exactly the same with the, the official of uh, the justice, uh, in the justice system. For example, one of the, the requests that is coming from Colombia is, is trying to give capacity building to the judge and to the, um, the fiscal, to persecutors, uh, in, in this area. No, no in the legal approach, because in most of the cases there is no uh, legal uh, binding, in, uh, uh, the actual legal binding, but, also, but yes in the interpretation of the, of the, of the, of the current law or to the uh, public, um, the policy makers when, when they have to review and improve the, the, the laws, the current laws. Uh, the, the other uh, conclusion from a point of view is the key issues have not been addressed effectively. We, we have been talking about some of those key issues. One is, is, is the extraterritorial issue, jurisdiction, but also the, the, the national public policies and the and the effect in the, in the foreign countries. Uh, the issue of the responsibility of the parent companies, uh, liability of the parent companies on subsidiaries or uh, supply chain. Uh, the, the barrier, the, the actual barrier of the foreign no convenience, uh, we have been talking on that, on civil law. The, the problems uh, of the ODA, the opportunity to, to improve the right to know and the access information uh, laws to focus uh, and to, on human rights uh, violations. Uh, that is, there's uh, limitation in, in, gener in general in all human ri uh, uh, right to know uh, laws. And, and for example, requirement, the minimal requirements on the diligence uh, expected in the businesses in some sectors, in some uh, conflict areas or, or things like that, that is not really clear. The other point in, in the state of duty to protect us should be the policy currents uh, is not assured. So it's very difficult when the, I'm talking in, in the national level, internal policy currents, but also in the international treaties. I'm really focused on international treaties because if we are going to uh, negotiate a, um, a bilateral treat, uh, trade uh, uh, treaty or invest treaty or fiscal or tax treaty, whatever, uh, if, if you are not considering a possible risk on human rights, that is that's going to work in the, in the duty of protect, but it also in the, it's not going to incentive and due diligence in the second pillar, and it's very difficult to, to access to remedy to, to the legal basis or, or no legal basis and the agreement mechanisms by operational. So the currents in the internal and external uh, policy, uh, the currents is, is key issue in that. The other thing is if we should 
we see the NAPS that has been approved uh, this year or last year, all are very vague in their content and, and poor in ambition. So much of them, is that, is that, they, they, we, we got four now, well, obviously the Spanish is not approved yet, and I don't think that it's gonna be approved in this legislative period, but, but the, the, the four is, if we make, it's not really a skill analysis, you can see that it's like a put in order different measures and, and very poor ambition. And, and it is very low knowledge, as I told you, the, uh, the, on the business and human rights in policy makers, public officials, and judicial actors. Uh, regarding the responsibility to respect, so focus on the due diligence and the, and the business the management, management. Uh, the, the, for example, one is, is a big confusion, it's not clear public requirements or expectation on what should be considered due diligence. So uh, there's a free interpretation of, in different sectors, in different countries and different companies. So it's very difficult to, and the NAPs don't give uh, light on that as well. So uh, NAPS is a national action plan yeah, on this point. And, and also there is a very low knowledge on business and human rights in, in managers and employees. In general, there are uh, specific uh, cases that is not the case, but in general is that. Um, there's more commitments on human rights, public commitments on human rights that implemented in the management system, uh, proof. So it's, it's, very, it's very easy to sign uh, a declaration, but it's not really, it's not as, exactly the same easy to include in the management criteria and implement the, the measures. And, and few corporations are doing now a risk and impact assessment on their operations. And the other thing is uh, the transparency of the access, disclosure and access to information still is very restricti restrictive and poor. So it's very difficult to, from the transparency to improve the situation. Regarding the, the access remedy, well, the first idea that is shall be urgently addressed because it's the from the the, third, the three pillar the the uh, this pillar is is the poorest uh, uh, achievements. There's a false dilemma between local remedy versus international remedy, operational remedy versus judicial, non-judicial versus uh, judicial, non-public -pu non versus public uh, mechanisms. So the, the, the point is we have to consider that the focus on the effectiveness of the access to justice and remedy to the victims. And the, the rest is just tools. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's all. So it sh should be improved in, in every tool to access to remedy. Yep, five minutes. And, and the, um, well, the operational grievance mechanisms cases that as far as I know are very few and it's not proof that they are very effective. We are going to talk about the, the um, the fun of uh, Bangladesh uh, collapse, and from my opinion, it's not really it's not the best the best model to to but and the, and the effective is very very no it's not really good, and this a big confusion of the term of remedy as well, and this this is important because from the business uh, the, uh, the, from the human rights, the term remedy should be associated to re restorative justice. So focus on the effects and not just on the economic comp compensation. Obviously, economic compensation should be linked to the remedy. But, but the, the point is not, it's not just give it a contract between victims and the, and the, and the, and the business. No? And this uh, practical barriers accessing remedy uh, for example, economic awareness and capacity building. I'm going to focus in these four minutes uh, on the practical barriers to effective remedy. 
I'm, I'm talking about from the experience from the community affected by violation of business and human rights. Well, the first one, and that is not, it's not by law, it's not going to be resolved by, with laws, there's a lack of information and knowledge on their rights and how to seek protection or remedy, which instruments should be uh, go to, to access the remedy. The other uh, barrier are the social exclusion uh, context on vulnerable groups. The other is the imbalance power on resources between the right holders affected and the, and the businesses. So in, if we if we go to the, to the judicial uh, confrontation or the arbitration, uh, the, 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 the resources and the, the power of the different parties is completely different. The other point is we, we would like to be uh, focused on that is uh, the, the, the need to be protected to whistleblowers and human rights defenders because they are a very uh, re security risk on that, and they, they are the key, the key people to, to raise the problems to the, for the community, I mean. And uh, the other barrier is the weak independence, integrity, and impartiality of, of judicial, in some cases, and no judicial system, the prohibitive cost of, uh, to the right holder on the process, the lengthy process, the very long time period, a judgment in, in, in some cases are no enforced uh, when, when there's a, a judgment and, um, and sometimes mediation outcomes are unfulfilled for the parties as well and also obviously the corruption is a big barrier in these cases and I promise us five ideas and mainly changes in remedy or areas that should be work. One is uh, awareness raising and capacity buildings uh, to the victims, uh, right holders, civil society, even media for raising and, and the, 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 the point. Uh, support and encourage a judicial independence, integrity and impartiality of the, of the judges. judges. That could be maybe regional or international network uh, support, uh, sharing experience, expertise, and jurisprudential uh, uh, approaches. Um, improve the state based no judicial mechanisms like a, a national human rights um, uh, institutions and, and national con point, uh, contact points of OCD guidelines, and uh, the mediation uh, that is, it has been incre increasingly used um, should be not applicable in gross human rights abuses, and that in that case it should, should be judicial adequate. And, uh, and the, the other to the last idea that uh, this all to be more effective should be engaged into international law that could be in the treaty or universal review, review and the extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, for graded access to remedy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much. We have um, time for comments, questions from the panelists, the audience. Perhaps to just to very quickly clarify our terms of reference, right? Because Carlos talked a lot about the UN framework. For those of you who are not familiar with it, there's a first pillar addressed to states that is meant to restate international law. Whether or not it actually does that, people disagree about. A second pillar that um, is addressed to corporations, which is not strictly legal, most people think, uh, but it's, it's based on social expectations. And then the third pillar on remedies that combines aspects of law and, um, and non-legally binding aspects. Um, one thing I'd like to hear from you, having said that, and with regard to the second pillar, which I guess in some ways is particularly relevant for our panel, I mean, what's your experience with working with corporations in Colombia? Um, so were they receptive 
uh, do they um, welcome initiatives such as human rights due diligence um, and so on? If you could say something about this, I think that would be very interesting. Well, in Colombia, the, the point is if, you, if we, we are starting talking about human rights, it's very strange at the, at the beginning of the conversation because uh, there's a different concept of human rights. Uh, even, uh, uh, even now, if you're talking about peace, and the, 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 the things that uh, you have a political will with the word peace. So uh, they, 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 that's, we're starting in, this, in that context. So and, uh, at the beginning, uh, business and business association, that was uh, the main actors in, uh, around the table, was a little bit expecting what's going on with this. Because, but the problem was that, that the government take the lead, the, the, the leadership, and asking for business association and, um, and main business to sit in around the, the table and talking about this. When we're starting to discuss about what should be the challenges to implement this, what means exactly the responsibility uh, of, uh, of respect for businesses and what exactly mean the, the duty to protect of the states and what is to me exactly mean the access to remedy and the different instruments for agreement mechanisms and things like that. We're starting to discuss point by point and what should be interpreted in Colombian context. And, and now, the biggest business association, we are working together with them to, with, for, for doing, working with a, the, the, the different net business network, but also a million companies is working on that. Obviously, now is they, they are trying to, they, they are thinking uh, uh, with a new contest after the, the conflict contest uh, with the, the agreement conflict the peace agreement, they expecting that this in, in during this year is going to be finished the, the peace agreement, and they consider the private sector has been the in the the building the the peace building a, a, a very important role. So, to be honest. And they, they are more interested in, in Colombian businessmen, uh, women, in this issue than in some European countries. Thank you. Um, other questions to Carlos at this stage? Well, maybe then just, you know, add just a little note on this notion of peace building in Colombia. Um, to show again the other side, because you said that you know you found corporations quite receptive, and you of course worked mainly with, I assume, corporations from Colombia. But there are a number of cases, um, very serious allegations, uh, court cases, in which uh, the following happened: right, that um, corporations coming in from the outside, both from the U.S. and Europe. Um, in the mining business, uh, so operating mines in Colombia, feel threatened by the guerrilla. So what do these corporations then do? Uh, they finance state military and in particular employ paramilitaries to fight off the guerrillas. And then the paramilitaries um, engage themselves in rather egregious human rights violations, um, evicting the local populations, killing people all over the country, and then these are sort of um, issues that, where we are not talking about local corporations, but about global players, right? As I said, from the US, from Europe, yeah. uh, they are quite well documented, and I wondered whether uh, you have some, some view or some experience on these cases too. Well, there's a, a big cases in Colombia, because there's, uh, <laughs> and, and, and there's a new current cases. The, the, in the last December, the, the person in charge in the Colombian government go to the, the, 
annual forum on business and human rights, representing the Colombian government and, and the, in some panels, there are a group of victims uh, from Colombian regions asking for justice and asking for a remedy in a specific cases, given data, information, specific information. So the problem is not resolved, obviously. Yes, um, and there is a, in, in, the, in the conflict, there are a, a very close links between uh, private companies to the war crimes, uh, sometimes with a guerrilla and sometimes with paramilitary. Uh, for example, one is uh, the case of um, the banana, oh, the banana, no. Chiquita one, the Chiquita, but it's with, with a traffic uh, arms uh, with a, but there are other cases. For example, we, we have been involved in one case of a, a, a electric dump in, in Cauca, it's a region in, very close to, the, to Cali, uh, with a big uh, conflict between community with the, with the, with the company. That was a Spanish in the in the former um, um, well ten years ago and was sold to the Colombian invest investors, um, but the, the conflict is st keep still even in the judicial uh, uh, way, and and uh, there is a big big conflict and with mining with a lot of things. So that's the, I think from my point of view, this is a wonder reason because the government is, is, is getting the guiding principles like a opportunity to put in order the, the, the house with this issue, try to make instruments to put in order and what it should be done for you, what it should be done for me what should be done for a judicial way, what it should be done, what should be done with the community uh, consultants and grievance mechanisms and things like that is like a, a plan and try to put it in order, but obviously the implementation is very, is very weak and they are starting, they are now, are do, they are doing now the NAP uh, during this year, the, the, their commitment is finished during this year, the Colombian NAP, and they are starting to uh, giving capacity building to the hundred public officials, so it's, it's very, very, very few people starting uh, on that. No? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. There's a question to Carlos. As a chair, um, the, the, the title of your case study is Informal Justice by Spanish Corporations. What do you mean by that? This is what we're getting to now. Thank you. And it's not my title, but I'll represent it anyway. Um, so that there will be more opportunities to also ask questions to Carlos uh, in the end. So, um, so what do we mean by that? Um, well, let me first introduce the case studies and say a few words about this um, and also involve the panelists and then I hope we'll, we'll shape it in, in a way. Uh, certainly what it involves is, is asking ourselves um, what non-judicial possibilities there are to settle conflicts, right? Especially uh, not via litigation, um, but through settlements, uh, through, we'll see, um, donor funds that, that provide money to victims and so on, and whether this is desirable, and if so, in what situations. Um, the two cases um, that we chose are both well known, I assume, to most of you, so I'll keep that, um, uh, the introduction rather quick so we have time for discussions. Um, uh, one involves the Spanish corporation Inditex, and the other one, um, in a way also involves Inditex, but um, many other companies um, in the context of the, the recent disaster um, in Bangladesh. Um, so most of you, I assume, will have come across the Inditex case, case that involved the Spanish clothing corporation, Zara. Um, so we are in um, Brazil, where a Brazilian um, company 
A A AHA is responsible for 90% of Zara's Brazilian production. Now, the working conditions in this company are very poor, to say the least, uh, and in violation of Brazilian and international law protecting human rights and labor standards. Uh, for instance, people uh, work long over hours, um, 16 to 18 hours a day, Monday to Saturday, and if needed, uh, also on Sundays, they are subjected to constant threats, in parts physical violence to, um, so this is alleged, enhance the productivity of the factory to work even harder. Now, um, charges are brought by the Brazilian government against Inditex, um, the parent company of Zara. Inditex declines responsibility at first because this local company in Brazil says Inditex has violated its code of conduct for external manufacturers and workshops. Now, the Brazilian government um, countered that, after all, this local company produced cloth for Zara, which in turn is a subsidiary of Inditex, and therefore Inditex should be responsible for how workers are treated in its factory if you wish, irrespective of the legal form. Um, eventually, uh, Inditex and the Brazilian government, and here we're getting to the uh, informal, uh, reach an agreement um, according to which uh, Inditex would make a voluntary contribution. That's something you very often f find voluntary. Why? Because there's no admission of legal liability in these cases. A voluntary contribution of 1.4 million to compensate the workers. Uh, Brazil had initially claimed 10 million euro. Facts of the first case. Second case, uh, as I indicated already, um, probably even better known, the Rana Plaza uh, garment factory in Bangladesh that collapsed and killed 1,138 people, left more than 2,000 injured. Now here it should be stressed, I think, that um, the poor health and safety conditions and problems with the construction that were instrumental in the accident have long been known, right? And um, um, also accidents of this kind, but of a smaller kind, like especially fires in these factories, are the order of the day. They happen all the time, they have happened always, and they still happen. Only it seemed that it took, in this case, a major incident with a significantly high number of casualties to trigger sufficient international attention to get the industry in particular going to do something about this. At least this is one way to um, tell the story, let's say. Um, now, what happened again is that this conflict wasn't solved mainly through litigation or primarily through litigation, but rather um, there was a donor fund established, the Rana Plaza Donors Fund, uh, to collect, again, voluntary contributions from implicated companies to vindicate the victims. Now we know who contributed, again, among others, um, Inditex and the firm Mango, but we don't know how much they contributed because uh, the participants agreed on uh, confidentiality. Um, moreover, more than after the um, tragic accident, more than 150 firms signed up to a Bangladesh Accord on Fire and Building Safety um, that now um, uh, tries to take measures to improve the safety of the garment factories in the country. So much for the introduction of the cases. Um, as I said, what we're interested in is that these uh, these conflicts are not resolved and damages are not re rewarded through traditional judicial means or state enforcement, but we are seeing here alternative ways of approaching these problems, voluntary contribution, donor funds, um, uh, companies signing up to um, various initiatives to improve labor conditions, and so on. Um, I leave it at that as an introduction and um, would perhaps first ask um, my panelists and Carlos, um, whether they want to comment on either of the aspects that I raised. Okay. First of all, thank you for Globrands for, for the invitation to come here. Um, 
Uh, I am working in Gureak, and Gureak is a company which works with people for people with disabilities. We provide work for them, and we try to find to make them to find them in another companies. Um, I just want to make a brief reflection of these two cases. How can be possible uh, the responsibility and the liability of these two cases? No, in the the Brazilian government. Uh, claim ten, more than 10 million euro, and on the end of the of the history, in the text, only pay one one million from them. And in the other case also, uh, they estimate like 29 million uh, need to compensate the injured parties, and on the end we even know I don't know if it's one million or I was speaking with my colleague before, and he told me he he, he think it was one million the only the only money they, they required in this fund, no? And in relation with this, I, I was thinking to, to comment uh, our particular case, no? In our companies or in, in our world of the people of, with disabilities. It's suppose all persons are equal before and, and under the law, but the reality, even if uh, the, um, the law established many things and is quite developed, um, in 2006, they, they signed the Convention of the Right of the Person with Disabilities, and Spain ratified in, 20, in 2007. But nowadays, the reality is that uh, the people with disability, the employment rate is 40% in the Basque Country. And uh, for the people that are unemployed, unemployed long-term employment, there is, uh, they are 33%. And there is uh, some law, even international and European, even in the national government. And for example, for the work, they state all the companies, <coughs> uh, private and, pu and public companies, for more uh, over 50 workers, compulsory, they need to have the 2% of the workers, uh, they need to be people with disabilities. And they also, there are also some alternative measures you can comply, like contract uh, people with disability or, or different, make a donation or different alternative. But the most of the, there is many companies nowadays they don't comply with this. Or also they think uh, the sanction, they are ridiculous. They are 600, from, they go from 600 euro to 6,000 euro. So on the end, there is many companies, they say, for me, it's more easy to pay the, the sanction than, than to contract uh, disability people. So we think the right of the disabled people nowadays, uh, we, need to, to, we need to advance in this right, no? And another, um, another point I was thinking to, uh, bueno, uh, to comment is the accessibility. Um, it's regulated also, but there is many, uh, at least in Spain, there are many buildings without the accessibility uh, done. You know? uh, if you go with the wheels, there are many places you can never go in the private house. And not only physical adaptation, only the intellectual ad uh, adaptation. No? We have, we, maybe we are more sensible with this thing. And in our company, for example, we make one course to prevent the harassment. And instead to give the leaflet or how to explain to everybody, they give us one course to absolutely every person of the company from, from down to the, all the directives. And they are different courses. To the directive, maybe they give you the leaflet and they explain you in eight hours. Uh, the people, they have very low capacity. They need to give some one course of 20 hours with only with picture, playing. So you need to adapt. We think we need, you need to, the adaptation, they need to, Bit for for all kind of, of person, even intellectual people, and uh, I don't know. Uh, and in this way, also to say, we think to to remediate this, uh, to to try to arrive to the equal uh, to the equality. We should uh, work with the awareness uh, rising with the society. And in this way, we, we think we, everybody should promote positive action, positive action which there is some people, they understand they are not good, but with this, 
disequality between the um, with the people with disability we think you need to help them in one way to try to arrive to to uh, to the equality and the uh, comment also another um, um, case uh, to to awareness the society uh, other thing we we do it like example we are going now, we take, we think we need to educate the, the society and starting also for the children. We try to take, we are giving two years ago courses to, to the children and I think we are like two, three thousand children already give the course and we take them course every 20 or 30 children, we take to the company to see and to um, to stay and to speak with intellect uh, with the people with disability to explain what they do it in the day a day what the, um, the way they, they do their life I waking up in the morning and I go to work and to see the people and to understand and to feel we are the same on the end so we try to we, we can help with the human human right in this way and um, uh, for the last um, also, we think we, pro we need to promote the training programs and we believe and we, we work a lot with learning by doing, we call. It's like um, we make some programs, some educational, some training, which uh, we put the people to work directly or we find some company and we say let them to, it's, it's like a course but practical um, for work. So, I don't know. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for your governance for inviting me to talk. I wanted first to talk uh, a little bit about the convention that Maria mentioned, uh, that is the, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, and I think that this is a very important convention because actually it's the first the first convention on human rights of this century. And, uh, uh, and in, among other things, it says that uh, uh, not to provide reason, reason, reasonable accommodations is to make a, a discrimination in human rights. So I think this is very important in, in this field. Um, after telling this, I wanted to say something about the cases, both cases. I, I took uh, three ideas and I wanted to uh, achieve, uh, to get a conclusion after these three points. The first point I wanted to talk about is the problem. In both cases, uh, the, both cases are in relation with uh, very important human rights violations. So we can see that are real problems. And um, both problems are related with indirect sourcing, supply chains. So, uh, for example, in the first case, we can see that the company that uh, is under investigation is, is the parent company and it has a subsidiary that has a subsidiary that has a contractor that then have some subcontractors. So, uh, should be uh, responsible for the acts of the subcontractors, the, the parent company. Uh, we can think that, for example, uh, according to the text, we have some of the subcontractors were not authorized by the parent company. So maybe we can think that the parent company should not be liable for the acts of these companies. But if we read in, in the text, we can, it, there is a very important reason to make it liable. That is, a, that a company, that his business is to make clothes they must, they must know who is producing these garments, right? So I think it should be liable. 
then they can uh, claim against the, sub the contractor or the subcontractors that lie them, but the company should know how the contractors made the garments, because if they ask for 1,000 t-shirts in one week, they should know how they are going to, to do this. <coughs> then the second point, the first is the problem, the second is, um, is the <coughs> reputation aspect. In both cases, we can see that uh, the companies are very worried about, about this point, about their reputation. In the first case, we can see that the company pay a compensation, but telling that uh, he was not uh, responsible of these of this violations. In the second case is the same. Um, the fund is made in, some, in, the, in a way that companies can give money, but uh, it, uh, it doesn't imply legal responsibility. So they, it shows that companies are very worried about the reputation. The third point that I wanted to point out is, is the, that companies, they, they do a good job. They, for example, in Brazil, they create 7,000 employments. So uh, it, uh, I think that we, have, we need to, to have a positive point of view and uh, try to be constructive, uh, yeah, taking in account also that being aware that, that human rights are very important. So uh, uh, mixing the, the three points, I get a conclusion or a proposal that uh, we have to fight again against a problem that is the indirect sourcing, the supply chains, the control over supply chains. Uh, we know that reputation is important for the companies and also that they do a good job. So it's good for them that people, for, for companies that do a good job and uh, take care of the human rights, I think that could be useful to help them to, to disclose this information, to publish this information. So my, my suggestion is to uh, promote uh, laws on transparency. In, in this, in, with this kind of laws, companies can show what they do well. Uh, consumers, investors, NGOs can uh, decide uh, if they want to award the companies that do well or to punish the companies that do, do wrong. And um, so this information should be about the due diligence they, they have or in relation with the, with the supply chains. The difficulty is that it's not always easy to get reliable information but there are companies that can help with this. So this is what I got to Thank you. Let me just perhaps like tie some of the points together and tie it also back to uh, the te theme of our panel. I mean, you mentioned the problem of non-compliance, right? Um, now, and this is Spain, right? Um, then uh, when we're, enc we're encountering different kinds of problems of non-compliance when we're talking about Bangladesh. And you talked about the difficult legal structures, right, that we're um, dealing with them as, as lawyers all of the time. But that means it's very hard to sue these creatures, right? They, we're dealing here with economically integrated entities very often that have, se have separate legal personalities. Now, both of these problems, um, if you want to pitch it at a bit more of a general level, may explain some of the attractiveness of a more informal approach. Uh, one is and that's something we see very clearly in Bangladesh, we may want to talk about again, is, is, is a sense that the state is not really and no longer uh, in um, sort of on top of the process, in control of what's going on. Um, Non-compliance is but one issue here. Which state? 
the host has... Uh, uh, sorry, in this case, well, um, in this case, I'm, ta we're ta I'm talking about Bangladeshi, that's what I said. Sort of that, in, um, I can that make that a bit more concrete, or, or in, uh, often the state is part of the problem. Um, okay, maybe, maybe to illustrate it quickly so that we know what we're talking about, um, without taking up too much time, a few years before the Rana Plaza disaster, there were social unrests in, um, in Bangladesh because uh, the people tried to raise the minimum wage. Now the international buyers, um, because people buy, they don't incorporate in Bangladesh, the international buyers uh, were quite willing to accommodate the demands of these people, partly to sort of calm down the situation. Uh, in that situation, the state intervened. State meaning members of parliament who own significant shares in the local garment industry and blocked it basically threatening the international buyers to, to end business relationships uh, because the argument was they were undermining the stability of the Bangladeshi economy by trying to raise the wages, right? So this is, a, is one of the examples where the state is part of the problem rather than part of the answer. And a question whether, and one of the, perhaps the rationales, that's a suggestion for discussion, why informal approaches between the corporations or the corporations and the trade unions, though trade unions are a difficult issue in Bangladesh too, uh, might be attractive. Um, do I raise um, some comment with this comment? Anyone wants to? Yes, please. The, the one comment, and this is something I'm going to come back to tomorrow morning, but the, the one comment that I would like to make is really for companies, at least the ones with which I work, the most important thing is the reputation, the image um, aspect of it. And I'm concerned about informal justice not being enough because of the confidentiality, and you mentioned that uh, yourself, and I think, um, to me, there is a problem there. And I know with the Rana Plaza, I mean, the, the French national contact point was very, very active, also because of the, of the government, um, but that was the home government, because we found a lot of French companies who were actually having their products uh, pro uh, produced in the, in the Rana Plaza. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's my main concern. You know, confidentiality and, and the one story that the businesses understand is actually not there. Thank you. Can we um, also here, can we have some more views on this? You know, what, what do you think are the advantages, disadvantages of moving away from these formal uh, law-based uh, mechanisms towards what we here call again informal Uh, well, yeah, the, the first de, uh, figure I would like to put in, on the table is uh, Bangladesh is, in that time was the second supplier of the EU, uh, European uh, garment companies. So the, there's a big uh, power in the trade agreement, even in the European economy agreement. So. And uh, during the first week after the collapse, uh, even in the European Parliament, even in some European governments, asking for some punishments and review of the treaty on inc incorporating some uh, criteria uh, respecting uh, human rights. So uh, it's very linked between trade agreement and trade interests and this current situation. Obviously, the Bangladesh government failed in protect their citizen and their people um, because their policy, the policies doesn't cover enough and they don't give. But also, the European government has responsibility to protect and the, the duty to protect human rights abroad. And in this case, I think, we fail as well in to to manage this uh, this situation. 
previously and, and, and after the, the, the accident. For me, the, the effectiveness of the solution is not really effective. Is uh, also is no transparency, but also is is no try to restore uh, under the, the the human rights uh, protection. So it's trying to give uh, economic uh, compensation, and even uh, they, they didn't get enough money with the estimation that they they, they own estimates in in the in the beginning. So. Um, in my opinion, it's not the right way to, to manage this kind of accidents. It should be a study or reach other, other ways to do it better. Thank you. We have time for one or two last questions. There's one already. Yeah, just um, uh, a comment. Um, I think one of the problems that you're also facing with these um, uh, informal settlements is that they don't, um, th there's no um, threshold usually for victims to, to bring a claim afterwards. This is what we saw in the, in the Trafigura case, right? I mean, there was a, I think there was a big settlement with the Ivorian uh, government between Tra Trafigura and Ivorian uh, government, but then you can also raise the question whether that money ever reached the victims. Um, the victims says, say it, it didn't, and they went on and filed a suit against Trafigura. So I think there's also a problem for the companies involved in that they this is they may um, be hesitant to, to, to engage in these informal settlements because they cannot formally exclude the possibility of a later lawsuit. Any other comments, questions? So then maybe just to, to conclude by picking up on this point, I guess um, we're in a bit of a dilemma here, right? Because we've seen that often the traditional ways of addressing cases through law don't work. I mean, if you think probably the, the, most, the most famous, because early case, um, to introduce another case by way of conclusion, the Bhopal case, right? Where uh, uh, a US-based subsidiary, sorry, what's that? And they got two thousand dollars each of them. Indeed. So, <laughs> so on the one hand, we saw. Um, so the case was about um, a chemical explosion in a in a, in a factory that basically um, eradicated a whole city, right? And one on the one hand, that was in the 80s. So the judicial remedies were spectacularly unsuccessful, both in India and the U.S., where the parent was based. Uh, one of the, there are still cases pending. One was just kicked out of the U.S. system following Kyobo. So um, the, there was not much achieved in terms of the traditional ways of approaching these problems through law. At the same time, um, what we saw was a kind of contracting out of the victims. So after the disaster, the, the government, the Indian government, assumed the right to sue for all of the victims. Partly that was the motivation, according to the government, to protect them from the American lawyers flying in, trying to um, make business. Uh, and then they concluded a settlement that um, included very wide-ranging immunities for all the companies involved basically for the two reasons making it impossible, that's going back to the point, to sue, um, for, the, for, the, for the victims to sue. At the same time, indeed, the compensation was um, inadequate, to say the very least. Um, and uh, we've spent, then spent basically 20 years after this trying to um, get beyond these immunities, renegotiate, um, renegotiate the, 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 the settlement and so on. But the basic point I only wanted to make without taking sides is that uh, we face problems on both sides, right? The law doesn't seem to work the way we would like it to work and there are also significant disadvantages in leaving it just to uh, the corporations and um, the individuals. Um, and unless um, someone wants to um, comment on what I just said, um, I would uh, close the session with this remark. No? Then um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you for holding on to with us.